Hey, it's Pi episode. It's 314. Cuss is here. We're going through the play ins. We're talking about all kinds of stuff. Apparently, Double Flex is on the menu. Is it though? Or are we just Sim Team peeing all over the place? And Yiska loves dogs, don't you, Yiska? I, I love him. Love him. You love dogs. Big dog guy over here. With a, with <laughs> He's a, got that dog in him. My, my favorite dinner, for sure. What? <laughs> Fuck dogs, okay? With a tie eye. Wait, wait, whoa, okay, wait, 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 what, what is this dog hatred? I, I haven't heard this. So, he, he's got a weird history with dogs. We can start there. Okay, so I'm a pretty regular runner, I would say, like, it depends on, on the time, but like, I have weeks where I go five, five to six times, right? And okay. I swear during those times, I get attacked once a month. <laughs> but, and yeah, it's, it's... And it's not, it cannot be, just be my behavior in terms of like looking at them or like whatever it is because i remember a couple of times i was out with friends and we were jogging as well and then like just like a chocolate labrador would just like from behind just like lunge at my behind like i i wasn't aware of its existence it couldn't be me stressing out or me like yeah. right so like i don't know what it is but Honestly, like one time, I felt like pretty close to the afterlife because I don't know if if you know what a kangal is, like they're a kangal, a kangal. They're like no gigantic like mountain dogs. They're basically like what 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 it comes down to is you absolutely want to rather fight a, a an alpha wolf than a kangal, right? They okay. they are. They're heavier. like sheep herding dogs almost. They are heavier. They have higher bite force. They are scary as shit. And wow. one time I was on a run. And a, like, I don't know why couples do this, but they always love to have their little shitter like off leash <laughs> where I'm running. And an ankle biter just like straight beelines to me and goes for, for my shoes, right? And wants to bite me. Mm -hmm. And I'm already like super annoyed at this point. And I'll bring them up on screen. Um, and I, in the distance, see a Kangal, right? By a guy that legitimately weighs less than his dog. I'm already like, <laughs> fuck me. So it's, it's like a super tiny slope where I run. And then it goes down like, like a, a, a tiny path where I run. And then there's a slope down to the river, to the Rhine, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. And they're like bigger stones in the middle of the water, Right, like just where you can chill out and like people uh, fish there and whatnot. And I see this dog from like, I don't know, 200 meters away. And I just like say, okay, that small dog, it's enough for today, right? Like that guy, if, if that dog wants to eat me, there's, there's no way this guy can hold him. So I go yeah. down the slope, right? And as it so like had to be, this dog just like rips his leash off and just goes after me. And I'm like, just like, I'm not sure what, they, what it's called in English. I'm not even sure if you have those things, but it's like basically stones built into the river. It's called a mole in German. Maybe the, the Germans will be able to, but it's like big rocks placed into the water and they yeah. have like, um, like a, there will be like a lantern or whatever, like to signal sure, to, okay. to boats that you shouldn't drive as close, right? And then mm. when the when there's high tides, you, they will be underwater, it wasn't high tide, it was pretty low, and um, I just stood there, and fortunately, this dog didn't want to climb on these rocks, okay? Like, th that pissed him off, but I was ready to jump into the Rhine to save myself. It probably wouldn't have, we probably would have both drowned, but I would have at least taken that fucker with me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I think here's the problem with, with like, and you sort of hit on it. I don't think shitty dogs is the dog's fault. No. Shitty dog True. owners are the mm -hmm. problem. Yes, like, if you got that shit, you gotta have, like, especially if you got a big dog, like, my brother yeah. has a German Shepherd, and it's mm -hmm. like, that boy decides to go, like, you need a thing, and you need to be prepared for that at any time, right? Like, I also agree, those little fucking dogs, they're like, oh, he's a little dog, he's cute. It's like, doesn't mean yes. I want that guy fucking barking yeah. at me and biting me, yep. and like, People who have aggressive dogs, like I, I at my in 2019 when I was at my apartment complex, I remember like this pit bull just bit this other like person's oh dog, mm -hmm. and just like and fucking like fucked it up. And I was like, why would you like if you have an animal that you know has a temperament, like why are you not having mm -hmm. this thing like under permanent control, right? Like yep. I just 
I, I blame shitty dog owners. No, I don't blame the dog. Dogs are cute. No, I, 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 I agree. It is, it is absolutely like I definitely also before I like look at what the dog's behavior is like, I always look at the owner because like that's the telling yeah. thing, right? Mm. By the way, interestingly, I have no issue when when I front like homeless people are legitimately the best dog owners. They never yeah, act true. out like those those dogs are always the cutest. Never ha- heard a bark from them uh, anyway, right? But like, yeah. it's it's like. When you already see, like, maybe the, the owner's already drunk, it's already pulling at the leash. Oh, my God. Like, at least those are leashed, right? But, yeah. like, the yeah. amount of folks is, is maybe also where I run or, like, I, I had to kick a German Shepherd recently. It wasn't fun. <laughs> I, just, I feel just like kidding. they can smell your fear, Yusuke. They, they can smell at your disdain. Some point- I, I I was very much on that same tip where I was like, bro, you can't like this this you, you run into too many of these dogs that it's got to be you. But at, like, I mean, there's something me, too swear. like the delusional like countryside dog owner that just kind of lets their dog run, and I don't yeah. think they expect anybody yeah. to be around. So it's just like, oh shoot, my dog is off leash on property, and there's like some guy running. I don't know how they're gonna re- react or interact. And they just go after him, and the, yeah, it's the amount of times you hear after he has never done that before is yeah. Oh my insane. god! Oh All my god! Time. This is yeah. the first time. Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, this and to be fair, it has to be something about me. I'm not so sure if it's the beard, I don't know if it's the running cadence, something that I signal through my body movement when I run or whatever. But like it, something pisses dogs off more than the frequently than the the other runners, right? And mm. Um, I don't nec- I think I'm sh- sure at this point, like because my behavior changed due to learned behavior of like being attacked sure, yeah. without me doing anything, uh, it exacerbated the issue. But um, it's definitely also something where like I just get picked out of a group and it will mm-hmm. be attacked by this particular. It's just going <laughs> to specifically ruin my day that day. And I like I have like friend the dogs of friends or like family. I have no issue with. Right, like I, I know mm. these people. I know the dog. I can cuddle with them. I can play with them. I have no problem. But like, I, there's something about maybe how I run or whatever that just pisses dogs off. And also, by the way, by beating up this German Shepherd, I settled the debate that I absolutely could take a wolf in a one-on-one fight. Okay, <laughs> that's just entirely balanced. He was put in that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he took that would you rather and rathered it like he yeah, was, yeah. <laughs> he has first hand experience he will take the wolf on with a katana over getting bullet anted now the kangal no chance you're done <laughs> like yeah no a lot of a lot of chimp ones in there too a lot of like fighting a chimpanzee and i think a lot of people get baited fighting a monkey they're like oh it's like a cute monkey it's like no that thing will rip your face off yeah those things are like i feel like yeah no one really understands what a no. wild animal would be like how yeah. ferocious a wild animal is is just like on a completely different level who was it a vast who said that he could beat a bear he yeah, thinks that he insane. could take a bear yeah, sorry well oh, that insane. man is fucking insane <laughs> if you think you can take a bear i don't even know where i would begin to start of fucking up yeah, what's a bear, the str- right? what's the bear fighting strat like what are like what kind of macro game plan are we thinking here like is it guns because even then that's a well, bear. No, he said with his bare hands. I think his like logic was like, if I can punch it in the nose off the bat, but I'm like, if you miss that first punch, <laughs> like it's fucking over. Like if you're close enough to like try and punch it, like it's uh, there, there's no coming back from that. Like nah, he would I have, they, like he would try, and then he would be in the reverend too. Okay, like Leo would know yeah, in another yeah, Alice yeah, yeah, play. Yeah. I think everyone saw that movie and was like, you know what? Maybe I'm not gonna fuck with bears from now yeah, on. Maybe. Like that was graphic. <laughs> like yeah. <laughs> nah, no shot. Like uh, uh, maybe he will, would um, actually it, and it's like a eh, small brown. Like I'm not sure what they're called, but like smaller bears, like, probably more scared of you than right. Yeah, like yeah, yeah sure. those. But like a grizzly or whatever. Nah, Kodiak, <laughs> no shot, dude. Like you're I think just polar bears are pretty like polar bears are so too. yeah, they're, they're super fuck aggressive. Yeah, as well. yeah, fuck yeah. Like that's that's the fun thing. My my dad went on a cruise and mm-hmm. he went to Iceland. And every day they had like, they booked like a tour, right? Except the one time they went to Iceland. And they were like, oh, we're just going to walk around here. They go out to Iceland. It's just like a a thing there that says, 
you cannot go past here because of polar bears without gun and like you know someone escorting you proper yeah. safety and yeah. that was basically like it for for that uh excursion because like <laughs> so polar bears at that time of the year are too dangerous in that location apparently wow out on yeah, a hunt. Hunt. bears scared the fuck out of me which which people think are really funny because like I, I would much rather go be in Australia yeah. and deal with brown snakes and spiders sure. than because it's the it's the evil that I know, right? Mm -hmm. While bears, I've like never seen a bear. And yeah. you just hear stories of people getting fucked up by bears. And I went camping in north of Toronto uh one time, like a while back, and yeah. like they're like, Oh yeah, we have to hang all of our food between yep. two trees and you're like and you know bears can climb trees you just try and put it up there and stuff like that so i'm like well i'm fucking terrified because like and it was like no they're harmless just like leave them alone or if they do attack you just make a loud noise i'm like what the fuck are you talking about make a loud noise like what happens if it doesn't like that so yeah bears scare me i just i just don't get them but i understand people who have lived around bears yeah just like, oh they're so harmless they're cute like what what about they, the, they're pretty docile but what what are, what are the evils that you know is there any like legitimately scary animal that where you're from that you ha sh uh, have to learn to look out for well yeah like in, in australia like where like we i'm not like much in the country but i live pretty suburban like you want to be careful walking through the garage like, sure we have red back spiders those things bite you they will fuck you up like you're gonna have to go to the hospital or you'll die mm -hmm, right okay. same thing with brown snakes but it's it's like a lesson that you learn is like when I'm walking through the garage, I'm not just going to walk into the dark, dank corner yeah. and just like start picking shit up and not looking what I, what's going on. Or, you know, when I, I'm not going to walk through the brush in the middle of this like desert yeah. area where a brown snake could just be vibing out. So it's it's kind of the same thing with bears, right? It's like you just mitigate the risk right. as much as you yep. can. Yep. 100%. And yeah, it, it is fascinating to hear people from like that side of the world because it is like for us, it's like the the great outback and like there's so many poisonous yeah. and venomous and all the reptiles and it's like, oh shit, so many things there can just fuck you up. And it's just like, yeah, but we don't realize that like we have like mountain lions and coyotes and bears yeah. and like we have a moose. nothing. Like people don't realize that like a moose will fuck your, your shit sure. up. Like a, a moose is like fuck. People don't like think about a lot of the stuff that we have that like very much in the same way that like some of the yeah. rest of the world just doesn't have and it's just like i've never interacted with so like yeah a bear like what the fuck is a moose doing over here like these things are massive <laughs> yeah no for, yeah, no for us everything has been killed that's remotely dangerous <laughs> other than dogs <laughs> so dogs are the last conquer, frontier baby. okay <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so, uh, oh man yeah that no. that said, with the the ecological disaster that is Yiska fighting dogs, Custa versus a bear, and me getting snaked, um, this episode is brought to you by our beautiful patron producers. Um, those being Battlecraft, Refine, Bean, Bronze, Babu, Help, Picasso, Lulshin, Porkchop, Sammy, Rex, Zane, Volumel, and Sugar High, and our YouTube members, Blave, Bliss, IMDRW, Brother, Adam L, Ice Ham Jello, Fire Element 6, and AK. Sorry, I had to get it in there. Yes, can continue what you're saying. No, I was just thinking about like reading a story about a woman going like, "Oh, this small octopus with like the blue little cir like circles is so cute." Mm -hmm. And apparently, it's like a highly venomous thing, and if it bites oh, you, no. you're like, immediately dead. <laughs> An octopus, really? <laughs> yeah, like a small one somewhere uh, uh. on some coast in in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of those. If you don't know what it is, it's generally safe practice to just avoid it nah, as yeah. much as you can. Don't fuck yeah. with it. Yeah, don't, it's like, uh, you know, people, uh, koalas are a great example, right? Koalas are pretty cute, right? When you see them from a distance. Sure. Those things have the world's sharpest, well, not actually the world's sharpest, but they have sharp as fuck claws. Like, if you mm. get too close, like, if they swing at you, it'll, it'll like, it'll it rip your shit. skin off. Yeah, it'll Jeez. tear everything off. And they also have chlamydia. Like yes. every single koala, dirty I think, has chlamydia. Yeah, they're just dirty as fuck and they're high out of their minds yep. on eucalyptus. So it's like you don't know what they're going to do. Uh, so, like, that's a classic mistake of like, because we have koalas every time, uh, like all over the place mm -hmm. uh, at where I live. But yeah, Shout a out lot the of drop like, bears. Yeah. 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 And drop bears. You know, you got to be careful of those. Um, like, yeah, you just got to don't touch them ever. Mm hmm. And I think that's like the American tourist trap where it's like, oh, it's a cute little bear cub. And like, they're so cute. And they're just eating their little leaves. They're just little guys. Meow, 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 meow. And it's like, no. Dirty. Also, gross. They, when they fuck, they're so loud. Holy really? shit. But yeah, because <laughs> we have a lot know. of trees. 
And like, we know when a koala has set up in one of our trees because you'll hear it at like six in the morning. It's just loud grunting, like very loud grunting. And you're like, oh my God. Good times. Miss Australia. Hilarious. (laughs) What What a scene to wake up to. Go back to bed. The koalas are fucking. <laughs> oh man! If now this is not a primer for the entire episode. There is actually a lot to talk about, but like sometimes you just need to. You just gotta warm it up a little bit with some banter. You gotta get a little. Who's got a little taste of home? Who's the the bear you wouldn't want to fight in play ins show? The bear I wouldn't want to fight in play ins. There's a there's a couple bears I would not want to fight in play ins. I think the biggest one is maybe the Boston bear. The great the great uh, uprising bear is probably who I would not want to fight. No, and then there's some that... like wily ones. I don't know. Yeah, like I think the Boston uprising is the bear, while like maybe mm. the London Spitfire is like it's like a a venomous. Like uh, what, what analogy? To, jellyfish, you know. <laughs> okay, it's like sure. it's like it looks harmless. You don't think much about it. You're unsuspecting, and then fucking boom, it touches you. You're dead, and you lose the game, right? Yep. And that's kind of like what happened to the London Spitfire. Like they underestimated the strength of London Spitfire, and I think a lot of other teams do as well. Like in mm-hmm. this meta, the Ryan Sim shit is difficult to deal with. Mm. It, they're they're a tricky team. Like they're. I, I we had Chris on a couple episodes back and he was talking about like all their like sim stuff and he's like oh I hope somebody picks Gibraltar against us and we're gonna run like Ryan against him and he thinks like Ryan's like just the shit right now and I'm like sick like I'm here for it give me some more styles and I think when you look at their their shot game and you look at their game versus Boston like they're trying all kinds of stuff with their TPs they're sending solo TPs they're sending they're sending BAP and, and Bastion and they're trying to just get like a quick wheels out like in their face. They're doing it with window hotties just now flanking constantly where they send four one way and he just kind of like stands there and then just pins into you. And it's they're they're tricky, man. You don't know. I don't know what to expect. You they could come out and they're, they're like a little knife fight. Like you just you don't know where the knife's coming from, but it's going to it's going to bite you. I think you you saw some counters coming out from Boston. You, mm. There is a there is a cap to the effectiveness of the yeah. Lund- London Spitfire, but the question is like, do any of the other teams other than Boston have that ability? Like, obviously, Shock came up like very yeah. empty trying what they were trying to do. You cannot, and I think this is a an issue that I think the Shock ran into, and why I was pleasantly surprised to see Boston beat it is. You can't just beat it with individual mechanics. Like you yeah. can't just hit them with the "Hey, we're better than you." You need to have the coordination and a game plan to be able to deal with it. And that's my fear of like, you know, the other team that is favorited to make it through. Does a team like Toronto Defiant and the composition they're playing have the ability to handle this Reinhardt? It's it it, it doesn't feel like Defiant as a whole. I I. There's there's a part of me that want like here's like the Timmy's going, oh, at least like the you know, the Timmy's that like watch the games. They're like, oh well they could just like poke down the shield and it's like there's no shield to shoot. Like they're just hiding behind a corner and then they three two one, they TP behind you, and then like Hottie's pinning from like an off angle and they're just on your back line. Like, what is Alari supposed to do? What is Bap supposed to do? Like lamp's yeah. only gonna last for so long. Like they're just in your face. There's no poking going on. They're just on top of you. And that's where it's like, and you can kind of podcast listeners, you can't see it, but like on your screen. We've got a little bit of a, a clip from Midtown and that's where it's like, I feel like London are at their, they struggle a little bit on these escort hybrid objectives where they have a little bit too much distance to cover. And it's not just like a one TP jump in, get, get into the fight where like a control or like a flashpoint is going to be, but these like multi TP, like leapfrogs, like maybe you used to see on like Hanamura back in the day it's just a little slower and it gives teams way more opportunity to kind of collapse in on them. And they have to like, it's still, they have like a very clear game plan of like where they want to go, where they want to fight. They'll try to like get a tick here and there, but I, I, I kind of want like a little bit of different looks maybe on like escort. I don't know. I think it's also, think, sorry, real quick. Yeah, just, uh, there you go. I think there's, there's a, it's something to be said, not just about the distance covered, but also the quality sure. of the options that they have for their TPs. Because it feels like yeah. it's not like they have one set route that they want to handle. I think like every time, like just look at what the how their opponent positions yeah. and like what time it is in their rotation or whatever, and then they just decide on a on a teleport location. And that might be like three to six different 
locations that they might teleport you on in any given moment. And that very much is down to map architecture as well, right? I think so too. I think Midtown A in particular, there's it, it feels like there's not a ton of options where it's like I need to get from like under the train yeah. to the point. And the only good way, like the only good place to like put your TP exit is like either like to the right in like the like towards the spawn in that little closet like area or to the left with the health pack that like leads up to the high ground and you kind of see them getting funneled in there a lot and like bastions all gets kind of like a lot of value in there because you're all just bunched up you don't have a ton of space to like run around so like there are points where yes you should be able to tp all over the place get a ton of value they have all their flow charts but there it does feel like there are some mismatches in the map pool that they're just like yeah we don't really have a ton of like optionality and that's where it's just like i f there is i feel like there's room for them to like maybe deviate a little bit where it's not just like oh we just get off Rhine. but i'd like to see sparker maybe on 76 a little bit i feel like you can keep backbone on may maybe you still play the sim stuff and you just let sparker run around i i'm i'm, I'm bought into the titan stuff which we'll get to but like he's saying just running around being a little nuisance i feel like you could splash that in every once in a while and maybe catch some people off guard I think that's like a required adaptation that the Spitfire needs to like throw in. And I think that's mm. something that was a little disappointing about the Boston loss, right? Is that they yeah. didn't really have that adaptation. Yeah. What they were trying, what stopped working, right? In a lot yes. of regards. And instead of being like, well, maybe we can throw these minor iterations in, right? As you said, the Spark a Soldier or something like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like they just went down with the ship and yep. you kind of need to do that at this point. And I think that's kind of the London Spitfire. They're just going to go down playing with what they know. But I, I agree. The The thing that always impresses me so much is what sort of Yiska hit on a little bit, which is they ha really seem to have an endless playbook on every single map of like being able to TP into certain spots. Yeah. And the fluidity in which they do that as well is the thing that makes them so successful, right? Their ability to set up a TP and their entire team to go through it instantly yeah. is what is their like secret source. Like you, I think it's actually in this match in particular where you don't see that level of coordination from uh, Shock and it's specifically Proby who like sim TPs into the opposition and just teleports on his own and then just yeah, dies. Yeah. And you're like... That never happens to London, right? And everyone's always waterfalling and cascading into these teleporters. So I don't know. I think there is an end of the line coming for London Spitfire. The question isn't really like, are they going to win the Overwatch League? It's more, where does the run end? Are they yeah. actually going to make it to the playoffs? Or And if they do make it to the playoffs, will that work in the new patch as well? That's That's kind of another big question is like, Especially for a lot of these more stylistic teams where it's like, you know, the patch isn't huge. I think the obvious like winner here is like Zarya or Issa being like a little tweaked. The Queen stuff isn't huge. I feel like maybe the Bastion stuff, I think last patch was kind of slept on and I think teams got a hold of it and really kind of saw the value there. So him being a little bit tweaked um, could could alter things. But do we think that like a new Zarya look is really going to like upheave all of the meta or is it just going to add to it? That the big question, like I've played a bunch of ranked since I came in. She's definitely a lot stronger. You can actively feel how much value she gets from bubbling other people. Sure. And I, you know, people love to be like, Oh, it's just a projected barrier. People are freaking out in the wrong, in the wrong way. But the projected barrier now provides 45 energy and not 40 energy. It also mm. has a two second shorter cooldown. And then when you synergize that with a DPS hero who can utilize those, a Reaper or a Genji or something yeah. like that, that's very valuable, right? And that, like, that buff is enormous. So you're essentially getting more energy, you're getting more bubbles, and you're absorbing more damage onto that one carry. So I think it will definitely get playtime. the question is the extent of how strong is it sure. does it completely invalidate the junker queen comp right because all of a sudden you can bubble off all of these you know rampages and or any of these dots that she's throwing out mm -hmm. does it invalidate the reinhardt all of a sudden the zaya has too much damage or you know people have made this example if you try to play zaya will teams just go back to playing winston yeah. like zaya gets kind of hard screwed by these Winston dive comps because it becomes very hard to get energy and it plays faster than you can keep up as desire. So if we do go into the next patch, for all we know, Winston teams might end up being the true winner. Yeah, because so, if memory serves like that last patch, he wasn't changed much. Like a lot of that comp yeah. just wasn't changed. There was just more like the Winston kind of 
meta got outpaced a little bit by some of this Junker Queen, Orissa, Bastion stuff. So could go back. I feel like the the social component is pretty big here because mm. the of course the teams that are already qualified are now already practicing with the new patch in mind, right? Right. And they just get to dictate whatever is going to be the thing, right? Like the playing teams, when they they are still like high on ad adrenaline off their qualification, and then okay, breather. Okay, when are our flight tickets? Okay, right. So scrim blocks. Meanwhile, these these qualified, especially the NA teams, those three have been in a hyperbolic time chamber because they can only practice against each other realistically, right? Right. Unless yeah. they find some contenders team or whatnot, and they already. Like even if they if it wasn't the absolute best meta comp, the best team that wins the most scrims there will, you know, determine in what direction a lot of the playoff meta will be trending because nobody else has the the amount of time required, right? I'm sure like if London was to make it, they would probably try their own spin depending on what the meta actually looks like, right? But I feel like the social component here is not to be underestimated that not just because uh, they have more time, but also the quality of their practice just because of the filtering right now would, in theory, you would think like they're so much better. You could also argue, though, that maybe they have some strategy in order to not necessarily like help their closest opponents the most. Maybe there is some way they can work around it with contenders teams or whatnot, not, uh, with your capacity, but the, uh, the quality of the practice wouldn't then be the same. What I can tell you is... Like a lot of stream blocks just have been cancelled based on that knowledge, right? Like because it, it makes it makes no sense for the already qualified teams to play the playing teams that want to play on the old mm. patch, right? So yeah, this this social component is not to be underestimated in this situation, I think. And I think that's a really important point when you think because whenever you go into a new patch, there is about a week of scrims where people are just throwing shit at the wall, right? Sure. Like you, every every team that goes into this new patch is going to be let's try Zaya, right? Like let's see how yep. effective she is, is there a comp here, right? And because you're still three weeks out from actually having to play those juggernaut teams that you're scrimming against, you're willing to practice against them so early on because what you're playing now isn't an indicator of what you are going to be in three weeks, isn't an indicator of what you're right. going to be playing then. So you're willing to show strats. And it's almost like them working together and collaborating to be like, what works, what doesn't work, and what do we think is the best? And this is what... As you said, these playing teams that are still trying to qualify, they don't get that luxury. Once this weekend is over, all the playing teams are locked in, then they have to spend that week working out what is best, right? Yep. And it's not as always going to be as easy as you can't just step up and be like, oh, what are the top three teams who qualified playing? What's Atlanta playing? Let's just copy yep. that. That's not going to work for you, right? Like that, That's not going to work for the London Spitfire. So they are at a massive disadvantage moving forward. You know, they're always going to be at a disadvantage. And I don't think it's the worst thing in the world, but that chasm might be huge between these teams given the limited amount of practice that they have to play. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely a lot of upside for the the teams that are locked in. I Color me a little bit on the flip side, I suppose, where it's like, I, I wonder if there is something, because we've seen in the past where it's like teams like London, teams that are like super, you know, hyper stylistic, they, they don't, tend to be super scrim uh, favorable let's say nobody likes scrimming the the ryan team nobody likes scrimming chengdu and their stupid ball comps so is there something is there something to the idea that whoever does lock in during play-ins is there is there a lack of experience with the new patch could that be more of a a boon than we're, we're letting on where it's like everybody's kind of like in this own i guess isn't there like a famous like movie director that like never like kind of like made it big never really directed a movie and it was the idea that like he looked at it from like a novice's eye and was like just very out of the box with like the rules and like everything that everything was like not standard with him and it made his movies more interesting i feel like maybe some of these playing teams depending on who makes it i'm looking at like toronto and maybe london probably is like the two that probably could maybe obviously Boston is like locked in maybe number one, but um, is there something to like, maybe this more stylistic teams that could be a weird again, like you said earlier, Custa, not a, not a, not a title winner, 
but like a big thorn in the side because they haven't been in that that scrim bubble of like okay it's Zarya it's this and that's what all you run and what the fuck are they doing on on Wrecking Ball or why are they doing on what are they doing on Doomfist like is there something there? I Not think that specifically. there is yeah there, there is that idea but at that point you're playing like Russian roulette right mm-hmm. and I think like let's uh, let's use a famous example because you brought up the Chengdu Hunters of. 2019 they were yeah. like we're gonna do this shit differently instead of playing goats we're gonna play wrecking ball right and yeah. you saw limited success at the very beginning of when they started doing it because people didn't know how to deal with it right like people oh, yeah. just straight up didn't have an answer to it but as soon as the cat was out of the bag everyone yeah, was, was like yep. okay well if we just and as soon as one person proves how you solve that problem right as soon as one team beats you in a match and people mm-hmm. can look at that and be like well that's what we do like then all of a sudden, it's over for that. And all of a sudden, they were now so far behind on what the actual meta was that they could never go back. And I think I actually, I've actually told this story on this podcast before, but that happened against us in Ch- against Chengdu Hunters in 2019. Yep. We were going into that match like, they're probably going to play Wrecking Ball. We should, we should practice. We watched their VODs. We worked out what our game plan was. And then they put Karyan in on Reinhardt. And mm-hmm. they were like, oh, they're going to play Goats. We fucking won because we know they just trash at the meta. Yeah. So that's, that's what makes it Russian Roulette. <laughs> is your yes you can have your pocket picks and do something different but there is a chance that it just doesn't work and oh, for sure. that's and that's the issue very few teams have been able to innovate and then have long-term success i think the only team that i can actively think of that I ever did that is dallas fuel yes uh and they did that last playoffs Maybe and when not they, even they determined the meta not even like season two stage three like shanghai with like the weird like multi dps stuff and that's I, I think the problem with that idea is that the reason a lot of teams started doing different things, like playing Sombra Goats, playing Farrow Goats, uh-huh. is because we were informed that we were adding uh, Warlock okay. in Stage got 4. It, it, so it. people were just throwing anything they could at the wall to get as many wins short term. You were no longer being like, we have to be good at Goats for the future right. because Goats was we know about it's to not gonna, exist. Yeah. And, that makes sense. And, you know... I, I, but that is, there is specialty, right? Like that, that playing a Farrow comp into Goats, that they became so good at it, no one could beat them. Right. On the Spitfire Reinhardt. They're so good at it that people don't know how to beat them until they do, right? And yep. that's, that becomes the inherent issue. And that's the same question I have for Toronto Defiant and the London Spitfire right now. How far can they go before it stops working? Yeah. I, I like what you, I like the analogy of the Russian roulette because it's like, is there, do we think, and this is no shade to these playing teams, but I, I think that both like Toronto and London, Boston, obviously, is, they're all very talented. But like outside of Boston, because I think you probably could say this about Boston. Are Toronto and London going to be able to like match up? Like if if we do walk in, if you're if you're either one of those those playing teams and you're walking into this this scrim bubble and it's like, okay, we're behind. We don't even know if we're going to mechanically be able to like pilot this, you know, composition. Is it worth much in that same like goats era discussion? It's like, okay, do I practice goats to try and you know try to make up the difference or do i just try to go for short term and make a stab and just try to spin the, the chamber and hope i don't hit a bullet you know is it like i'm a i it's it's tough uh-huh. i'm gonna be honest joe like they are playing for a good time in toronto right now it isn't like sure yeah if anyone that isn't one of those top three and a teams gets remotely close to sniffing at the final someone fucked up <laughs> like the not only are they clearly the most talented teams this season, right? Mm-hmm. But also the system is so stacked against them where Yeah. Like I'm not even I'm not sure what the what the already qualified teams are doing. Like theoretically, in a in a world where we're still like super like charged and have the, the resources, ideally spark in uh infernal They're already in here. a fly yep. in a plane, right? And trying to get in on that scrim. I'm not sure what's happening. I, I should probably ask that, but um, a team like whatever it's going to be in a play in in APAC, like uh, mm-hmm. maybe Dallas, right? They are sure. just so far behind; it's crazy, right? Like, and the the only th- copium that you could realistically have is is that you could argue there's no Zarya like Hanbin, uh, true left, true. right? So, like maybe that X factor introduces some volatility and also the expertise that Rush has for that particular meta as well, right? Yep. That could uh, bring some novelty into that. Anything else than a massively stacked deck on a balance side in favor of any of those play-in teams, and you're looking at 
like them getting their ch faces chewed off polar bear style okay like there's <laughs> they, it's not call back. it's not that the the, those teams are even like slouches in meta innovation, especially Florida being one of those teams. Actually, Definitely. probably like whatever the best balance state is, they, those fuckers will have played that comp at some point. Yeah, yeah. And maybe they might not be playing it. Maybe they will just have that as part of their like gigantic roller decks of comps they mm -hmm. can run. But they will have figured that shit out. Okay, and that's that's a big issue um, for the competition there. It, of course, like once you're on LAN, and <laughs> let's be honest, a lot of these players have not played on LAN. Yeah. There's another X factor introduced. That that's where my copium comes from. Not the oh, and then I come out of Plagueins, and there's a new canvas. No, there's a polar bear behind that canvas, it, Joe. <laughs> it, it's it's like here. Believe me when I say it's not like I think that they're going to like innovate and they're going to have the right meta read. It's more I I like what you're saying with like the volatility where it's like. I have like there's no reason for me to believe that like we're going to be able to catch up like hypothetically speaking on a mm. team's behalf like we're not going to catch up there's there is a lot of volatility volatility we're going to land we're going into these live environments there's a new meta everybody's kind of still a little bit unsure as much as everybody believes that you know they're high on their own farts there's still kind of like some shaky ground obviously you have a team like florida doing some wacky stuff um but there there is there's something there that I feel like some of these playing teams are going to be dangerous. I 100 percent agree they're not going to make it very deep, but I feel like there's going to be some serious upset potential, especially early on when they just I just don't see a world where you try to catch up or you're able to catch up. Maybe Boston can. I feel like they're capable of it, but. The, it's, it's, they're they're going to be that second playing team could be scary depending I'm, on who it is. I'm going to be, be honest. If I was a betting man, this is going to, like, if you do the math, it's ridiculous. 70% either Atlanta or Florida wins the final at this point. I think Houston, I, I, based yeah. on what meta interpretation is coming, is is out if the uh, Bernal report is already, like, um, yeah. like, if that rumor is true, they probably have an inkling where the meta might be yeah, going. Yeah, if yeah. they have to, like, not rely on Fearless to carry them, uh, or be they like, gone. that's a big weapon gone I'm sorry like Bernard is not going to be the same level of hyper carry on the Zarya role that Fearless mm -hmm. is on the Winston right like you can't expect that realistically the only player that is like this is Hanbin um, on that hero so like I just feel like it's it's uh, it's all going in in, uh, in Atlanta's I or uh, Florida's favor at the moment I think if you're the Atlanta Reign and you're the Florida Mayhem, I actually think the team you are most scared of is the Houston Outlaws because I think Houston is the team to play Russian roulette. Like, I think they're the team okay. that they... They're the ones that... Okay, the meta goes against them. They're the team that I think would do something okay, fucking different. Sense. And we, we even just saw that in this uh, summer stage, right? Where they played... Doomfist and a Kiriko or whatever the, yeah, yeah. the fuck they were playing. And they, they were playing something that no one else was even touching, right? And it mm -hmm. worked really well because people just didn't know how to deal with it. And I think Junkbuck's a good enough coach. I think these players uh, yeah, right. understand their limitations well enough that if they end up getting their backs against the wall, they'll throw something and they'll throw hands. And I think, yeah, it could go terribly, but even then they'd get like top four, I would still yeah. say. But I don't, I don't expect to see... Houston walk in and try and go toe to toe with Atlanta trying to play as I matter. Like that would just be a yeah, full zero. Yeah. And 100%. and they got the a time to develop a response, right? That's exactly, the crucial right? part, right? Yeah. No, I yeah. completely agree. Like that based on that, like Houston could be very scary. And to be honest, like just because they signed something doesn't mean it strongly suggests a meta position. I also think like this team is really after a championship. Um, so like the, the fact that they even would entertain something like that, if that is indeed true, um, is kind of dope, but, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely an argument that because they have the time resources as well, that they have a chance to catch up to these. Yeah. Maybe, maybe well, 70% is high. Yeah. Also, Yiska, I have a question for you. You're, you're a rules man and you sort of know a lot what's going on. Uh, so mm. I play, are teams able to sign any player that is a is a free agent like, like yeah, what that's is a, the limitations that's a great of question. this i think traits that's so okay this is just based on prior established um patents i think what is likely currently the case is you cannot sign or trade anyone that had an active psa by the time of the cutoff 
That yeah. I don't know when that happened. Um, so an, an active uh, Overwatch League contract. You can yeah. sign contenders players. And how that translates in APAC, I have no idea. If that also <laughs> translates to that, their contracts. If you could, for instance, I don't know, sign someone from, from Dreamers or whatever just because they are not no longer in the Overwatch League or they cannot make it, could you sign someone from Dreamers maybe, right? Like, I'm not sure how that works. Or O2, oh, could you sign who are you? I'm not sure. Could you sign Choice of One, right? Like, Choice of One is uh, someone who's not under contract anymore for the Guangzhou charge, as far as we're it's aware. Like, question, he yeah. is a great DPS player. He could get signed in. Obviously, most teams are looking at tanks with, you yeah. know, off tank meta potentially looming. But yeah, because I, I just, I haven't really understood the whole situation of like, because people like play it. Teams are signing players, and I'm like, we're in the playoffs. What do you mean yeah. we're signing players? Like, usually there's limitations on that. Uh, that window should be closed, yeah. Exactly. So I, I'm just trying to understand how the ruling is going uh, for the playoffs and, like, what what that is. Because we've heard rumors about all these players getting signed, yes. but it hasn't officially happened. So I don't know if that's the league stepping in or if teams are going to have the ability to do that and what the limitations of that are. Yeah, if I'm to- reading the breadcrumbs a little bit, are, are you maybe, like, kind of, like... Not worried. Worried's not the word, but like, are you pointing towards something? Maybe like a, a another decay situation where it's like, is this gonna maybe happen? Where like, uh, decay gets dropped or traded, and then justice like almost make it kind of I, vibes. For me as a caster, who a lot of my job is to build storylines throughout sure. the season of teams, the league, all that type of stuff. It invalidates mm. everything that we know to this point, right? Right. So like, Houston, exa- uh, Houston is a great example of if they sign Bernard to come in and play Zaire at the final hour. What do we talk about? Okay, Bernard yeah. is a great player, but we have no idea. We have no history. We had nothing yep. to draw from to talk about this player or this team, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, a funner narrative for the Houston Outlaws that we've been growing on is Felix is the only tank. He has to play something different. Right. He on can't. So now Houston does have to play a little cheesy. That's a fun storyline to dig right. into and for the playoffs. And now you're taking that away by just signing players in the playoffs where teams are going to look very different to the way they did to get there. And that's why most leagues don't allow those kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, as Eric pointed out, there's the precedent of like them signing a backup for Fixer. I'm not yeah, sure I, if the league, league would make an exception. I think like that's why you have a substitute, th- theoretically, as weird as it is. Poker would have realistic... Like, if, if all everything was close at this point, then Poker yeah. would have had to play flex support or they would have had to switch around some stuff. I think what realistically probably is happening is what I said. It's like... You cannot sign all players, which would be whack. Imagine like Justice doesn't make it and someone signs Eiffel Yee and like yeah. should just fly him out to Toronto, right? Like that would be stupid. That'd be uh, high. But choice <laughs> one. No, 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 it wouldn't. <laughs> It'd be fucked up. Choice <laughs> one would be high. <laughs> has not had an active PSA for a, a minute. Is a little I'm, bit, yeah. I, like I think like by those standards, <laughs> he should probably be yeah, eligible he should be able that? to be signed right like he hasn't played i think it was like july when he which is probably before the window yeah when he got dropped because so like there are teams that like could potentially look at him right like let's consider a team like let's go like London. dallas fuel or something like that <laughs> right Ooh. where it's like we end up in a meta where like all of a sudden maybe Edison's limited hero pools, like let's say it's not a Reaper meta sure. or a Soja meta, right? And you're like, well, we want someone with more punching power. You could sign choice one there and like he could absolutely come in and be a difference maker for them in certain metas. So Listen, I think right. that, Tracer, again, don't G. ask for permission. Yeah. Ask for forgiveness. Smart, smart. Honestly, it'd be the most just Dallas cool thing ever. Bring yeah, him just, to Toronto just, and just, just see what bring, happens. Just bring him. He's wearing a jersey and they're like, who the fuck's that? And they're like, don't worry about it. Don't let Sean Miller it. figure this out, okay? <laughs> let, let the front office decide and you guys just start winning games, okay? Just start, just, just win. Just worry about victory. And what are they going to do? Suspend you for next season? Come on. <laughs> yeah. <that'd be> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, I, uh, I think man. it is a good, but let's be honest. I'm not sure how many orcs are left that would pony up that also could u- realistically I hope lose the, use yeah, any the full armada. Just bring yeah. everybody. I heard you guys were talking shit, so we <laughs> brought the region. <laughs> that, that's the thing. Like, who would you replace on Infernal that and not feel like <laughs> shit yeah. that you like? Um, because I think like the 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 teams that are in playoffs are likely either. Mm-hmm. Um, already super squads where augmentation is very hard 
or they are like based on a team structure in the in the way how they play together and in like putting someone in last minute could threaten Probably. that uh, yeah that um like i don't know i feel like london if you like in the middle of the night come go into their room go like tp one two three their index fingers of their like left hand just goes to f like and clicks mm -hmm. right yeah and i i think it's really hard to um to get that if you pick up in the last moment regardless of the oh, economic sure. like realities of this league that it also would cost money to get someone over and mm, depending on who it is I think realistically, <laughs> maybe Toronto. Yeah, I don't know. I like. I could see like you can't tell me Soul Infernal aren't like looking at Mag and they're like, "Do you know how to play Zaya?" And sort of like <laughs> raising that question yeah, a little bit, yeah. and, and sort of like having like wondering like, is it like Infernal legitimately might be like. Do we just bring Poco to Toronto, like just in case? Like that's probably not a bad. Like mm -hmm. it's what's it going to cost you a plane ticket, right? Like yep. yeah, maybe it could work, right? And it could be better for them in the long run because if we do end up in a hard Zaya meta, there are a lot of teams that I think are gonna oh, yeah. get exposed uh, by this situation, right? And then all of a sudden, the depth of the Atlanta roster really starts to show its value. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's Dallas food doesn't make it in. It's the last hour. Just now, Dude, it'd be so. I, 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 I know Dallas fans already hate me, but it'd be so funny <laughs> if we ended up in a hard Zaya Reaper meta and then Dallas didn't make it. Like, I don't know. That that just feel funny to me. They don't make How it. You hate the boy. And Come then Hanbin steps onto the stage for the Just Now loss. Oh my! In a Texas yeah. <laughs> last minute Texas. Hanbin's music. Yeah. <laughs> my God. Do, 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 do. I like that would be the most. I mean. It's always been a joke of like, you know, what if we were just like professional wrestling at some point? I th I feel like we just kind of need that. We need like the Brenji to just come back and just like, <laughs> just like who who wouldn't just like imagine, imagine like the crowd pop if yeah. it, we, we're all expecting like a, like a, obviously like every like venue has like the arena host and it's just like they just get Bren and he's in his old like goofy like pool noodle like cosplay of like Widowmaker <laughs> like imagine the eruption of the crowd to like yeah. welcome that back in That's and then Hanbin's like jumping off and he's tearing off his jersey and as he's a Houston outlaw now like come on that That's, would, that honestly, would I, yeah, I, that that would be entertainment yeah I, I'd be down <laughs> and it, I, it'd be a good time so if I can I but like the they should just lean into the silly. Oh, yeah. Overwatch League fans also cannot tell me like all these like the the conversations on our competitive Overwatch are already tilting me again. Like glasses shoved up. Uh, actually, the the strengths of scheduling in A fucked some teams again. Like nobody, oh none of you fucks care about competitive integrity whatsoever. Stop lying and falsifying your preferences, you little shit. You do not care. And this, like, do you understand in what situation we are in? We are not optimizing for competitive integrity. We are optimizing for entertainment in a, a lot of those decisions, right? To pair... Like the, to criticize, there's ample opportunity and reason yeah. to criticize like how the format has worked here and there across this season. To say, oh, competitive integrity, when what it did is pair the best teams against each other more frequently. Mm -hmm. And yes, has probably fucked the glads out of whatever. Like that, the, you you are at a point in time where competitive integrity, if you adhere to it, you do not have competition. No. Right? Like, you have yeah. to design systems to keep the lights on. Yes, to keep the electricity mm -hmm. in the building on, right? So, like, while there are good reasons to be annoyed at format situations or, like, uh, decisions, that is not one of them. Like, the, it no. actually also delivered a couple of really good matches. And by the same token, personally, I, while I agree, like, the storytelling whatnot would be shit, at the same time, like if Hanbin actually did walk out for Dallas Fuel and get a finals MVP, it would be fun as shit, right? Like, and in, in in many ways, like it it feels like it could be the last celebration, dude. I'm feeling away, like seeing Flares. We're never going to see, maybe never going Good, to see yeah. Kevster on on like we're not going to see Kevster in Toronto, right? Yeah. Like that's already fucking insanity, right? Like it, I. Yeah. Johnny was ready to decapitate me when I said 
Cavs that does not deserve a DPS roll star this year, right? Like in the first <laughs> up to the first half of the season. Now, yeah. like probably doesn't, right? Yeah, no, he's that he's he's not going to be a roll star. I'm pretty sure, like at this yeah. point, right? Like he just hasn't lived out. And like I I agree with you, like Yiska. Like I think I actually think a lot of the issues of this season's format have been uh, harbored by the fact that. It feels like they're trying to make everything incredibly competitive via, uh, like, yeah. you know, competitive integrity, that it's made it so weird and so wacky that it's hard to understand. It's convoluted. And, yes. like, I think they're just listening to Reddit. Like, as someone who used to be a pro player, like, yes, it sucks when these things go against you. But, you know, like, even when I was a player, it was like, well, maybe we should just win more fucking games, right? Like, what what, it, what does it fucking matter if, oh my right. God, I had to play harder teams more often. Well, how about you just fucking beat better teams, yeah. right? Like, if, if you can't beat those teams, what does it matter, right? You want to yeah. be the better of the bottom half? Like, congratulations, it doesn't accomplish anything. Yes, there's money. Yes, you want to go to land. There's all those things. But just, I just want to see the best level of competition and mm -hmm. the teams try to beat the best. I don't want to see rules get bended. I don't want to see people... Things having to change because the competitive format has changed so much that it yeah. doesn't feel like I'm watching teams just try and be the best. It feels like I'm watching rules play yeah. out, and that's why what I'm watching. And so I'm having to watch the same teams do the same thing, doing nothing that's really changing or evoking, I guess, just excitement. Like I understand as a franchise league that we need to see every team equally, right? And we have to watch Vegas sure. play just as many games as Atlanta, but. I don't want to watch Vegas play as many games as Atlanta. I want to watch really. Atlanta play, right? I'd yeah. rather watch knockout games or small tournaments like we had last year with four tournaments that, yeah, people are like, oh, they can only play four matches. So what's the competitive integrity of a tournament where you have a hard schedule? It's like, who gives a fuck? At least we're watching a tournament, right? At least I'm watching some teams compete for something. And that's uh, really my take on it. And I think a lot of the criticisms that have harbored on Twitter and Reddit yeah. of the formats really sort of led us down this path of where we are now of they've tried to create something that feels competitively balanced, but it's led to just, in my opinion, less impactful matches more often. 100%. And, and some of the biggest esports in the world don't have like the most competitive integrity focused formats. I mean, League of Legends still, if we're, if I'm, remembering correctly the world is still like single elon like hey nobody likes that but you know what people fucking watch why because it's an entertaining product and it's you know one shot that's all you got sometimes people get upset and you go the distance obviously it's not the best but you know there are stakes on the line right there, there's a reason why like march madness obviously is like the, the big analogous thing for for western fans but yeah like uh, that's that's a big thing in like american sports i've been getting more yeah. into like as i've been living in america like Fucking, you watch college football, right? You mm -hmm. lose one game that you're not supposed to lose. GG, you don't get to play for the fucking final game. Like, yeah, yep. yeah, that's the thing. You know what the solution to that is? Don't lose. That's what yes. makes great teams great, right? And that's what yep. makes the competition. When every match you are fighting for your life and fighting to accomplish this greatness, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. it's not relative to Overwatch League or esports as much, but that creates hype. And that's where the excitement comes from in my opinion and i think sometimes in esports we coddle players True. too much because obviously we have a lot of uh compassion for these people yes. as we have more control over their lives and we see their careers and we feel uh, a more uh shoot what's the word for it um parasocial attached parasocial parasocial yeah. attachment to these players right but at the end of the day we're top end competition and people should treat mm -hmm. it like that right and yep. that's i think that's a frustration that i've had with a lot of esports over these last, not just Overwatch League. Like. Yeah, it's, it. Agree. You need to, like, you need to introduce some form of negativity. Like, it, there's a there's a weird thing. I'm sure it is in other countries as well. I just know it from the German perspective. But legally, your uh, prior employer is not allowed to give you a bad review. So what developed is a codified language of positive adjectives that <laughs> will tell your next employer that you're shit. Okay, like that's so funny. <laughs> be because, like, a negativity needs to be expressed. But if everything is good, then nothing is right. So you kind of need to set a new baseline. It's, it's, okay, like this is why, like the the word goat now means absolutely nothing anymore since yeah. Zoomers <laughs> had, their, had their shot at it, right? But, but the bottom line is, like, I agree. Like, there there needs to be some negativity introduced. But basically, what I would like people to stop messing with the livelihoods of folks 
Because here's how his, how his system works perfectly, okay? Talent says some shit. Play, like, fans of the, the victims of that shit get angry. Talent goes, that's my job, pog. Team that was victim of that flame does <laughs> not go to the league and call that out, but rather realizes that the pie has just been grown by everyone getting pissed off collectively, and they might even get some fans out of it for being in that position where they maybe justly or unjustifiedly were called out. And we're not doing this, uh, could you stop that? Um, we're like, if you don't stop that, we don't know if this will, you know, facilitate a future where you can still be brought on blah 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 like no yeah. like stop fucking with people's livelihoods in that manner right like don't don't set like negative reviews or whatever it might might be I, i'm not saying that anyone would get fired for continuing that but like more like where it has professional repercussions it is actually part of the deal to be the yeah. asshole right like i i think and it is also the fans' job or the fans' entertainment to go into the subreddits and the in in the Twitter feeds and go like, ah, oh, this was like way too hard. Like, why would you say that? That's part of the entertainment cycle. Yes. That then the yeah. other party goes like, ah, no, I actually kind of like that. Like, you're way too soft about this. Blah blah blah. And that kind of like interaction is is the friction. This is competition, right? Like. If if it was any other endeavor of like if we're looking at a beautiful art piece or like we we're, we're I don't know we're, we're dancing or whatever like we're not trying to compete against each other and trying to like you know we're not jamming out we're actually legitimately trying to find the best solution for a problem that has no. r really clearly defined rules right and there is some friction there to be introduced and to to sanitize that is is a problem and I I think like. For a lot of it, the problem is that the power and the incentive structure is for teams to realistically, like sometimes things go too far, to like protect sure. their brand. But it should realistically, like yes, everyone should say their thing, and then nothing should change realistically, right? Like, yeah, just keep going. That's how the sports industry does it as well. Like that's one of the yeah. the few comparative examples where sports entertainment and esports entertainment kind of actually whether the similarities work because it is in the way the story is told is very similar right like it's a competitive <laughs> environment where there, there is adverse adversity there is like competition and like competitiveness of ideas and like you know like one of the biggest story narratives in the NBA that are selling is like you know the old guard against the newer ones, and mm -hmm. how that would have, for, like, all that that friction is what makes the competition spicy. Of course, you have to have thresholds. Like, you cannot get personal or whatever, right? Like, keep keep it on the game. There, there's obviously a Gucci, line, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Like, it's I I understand. Like, basically, whatever in esports is actually really easy. You never criticize. The person behind the nickname. Just go at the nickname, the player that you're on the server. There's a clear delineation between, you know, like Huang Leaf Shin uh, or Huang Li uh, Shin is like Leaf, right? Mm -hmm. And leave the player, right? I, I don't know none, nothing about this motherfucker outside the game. I can just like, it's really easy to, to differentiate between um, the private person and the player. And the player should just like whatever goes, goes basically like if you don't perform you get it right like and yeah. i think that's that's the opportunity by the way if if we're getting a new um new approach next year i, I mm -hmm. hope they realize that that is r like the 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 friction that is created there needs to be there and we will have to leave a lot of folks like i i'm not I understand that a lot of folks that are in Overwatch are specifically here because we do not have this, okay? Because they like that that it is more harmonious than other competitive. I think, unfortunately, you're a minority in people that were are likely to watch an eSport, and you will probably, like you sh in in the best ideal world, the future products will not ac like accommodate what you want. Out of an esport because the the other audience is way bigger. You want the tribalistic nature of like 
a French crowd, right? You want the tribalistic yeah. nature of like regions against each other. You want someone saying some shit on the a broadcast about like what the fuck was that graph? Like that that's that's a like insanely bad thing. Like you you want the Nene graph to be like to be memefied for the eternity and be able mm -hmm. to do that on the broadcast as well, right? So yep. yeah, I th I think um, there. Uh, but that's that's also an, a tale as old as the Overwatch League. That it it was always a problem that because ownership had was so close to the games that they had too much power. Like it's totally fine for the owner, by the way, to complain publicly. Just yeah, don't force the, the front, front office. office. To... Yeah, why would you? Why would you try to knock at the front office door? Like it's already like, I'm sure when you said the stuff about justice, right? I'm sure like yeah, you so... you took something away from the public backlash, and that already like sort of had an impact on how you wanted to present your opinion in the future. That is already a pruning that is happening there. You do not have to do, do it on any other level than that, right? Yeah, and I think that like that, like those kind of things, like it, it's something that a lot of us talent have been like struggling with because it's like you do have to be careful when you're criticizing certain things because mm -hmm. there needs to, and it, importantly, there needs to be validity to the statement, yes. right? Because sure. something that I think the NBA struggles from, uh, you know, <laughs> using that and the new media is people just say shit for the sake of saying shit oh, yeah. these days just to get traction, right? You know, I'm looking at you, Perkins. Like, it, like uh, and that's really where the the you need to keep focusing, but I think there needs to be a line where talent needs to be able to criticize and do their job because it's not a participation competition. That no. This is not something like we're playing at the highest level. There needs to be some level of criticism when mistakes are being made and when they're perceived to be happening time and time again, all that kind of stuff. And that's why, you know, I literally that day that I did the Washington, I was watching that match sitting there and I'm like, no, nope, I'm done. Like, I'm, I'm, done. Yeah. I'm saying I'm going to say something because this is like. <laughs> It, it needs to be said, right? Like yeah, something yeah. needs to be said at that point about, hey, like it doesn't just need to be a Reddit meme. It doesn't need to be talked about. It needs to actually be addressed. Yeah. And like, you know, as Yiska said, I'm not attacking players. I'm not attacking oh. the front office. I'm not attacking anyone personally. We're talking in broad strokes about the, the team as a whole and how they're performing in the server. That's how everything needs to say. And I think that needs to be continually addressed. Otherwise, at this point, we're just a Mickey Mouse competition where everyone's just happy to be here, which I think has become a problem with this current Overwatch League franchising system where you can just participate and you are doing fine, yes. right? Where yeah. what I'm hoping is if next year we do go into a more open circuit situation where teams have to qualify, every team has to put their best foot forward because they have to play and compete to be able to qualify, to be able to prove they deserve yep. to be there. So we don't keep having, you know, let's use a Valiant as an example, where they're just fielding a team for fielding a team that's never going to compete, that shouldn't be there, that's not fun to watch in a lot yep. of regards, right? Um, so I'm hoping that we have more of that going forward and that team, that competition will be at an all-time high, regional pride will be at an all-time high, and that people will be able to feel excited and feel like matches actually matter because... You know, as I've said multiple times throughout this podcast, that is my biggest gripe with where the league has gone is it doesn't feel like matches matter that much. Oh. Yeah. It's by the way, on the topic of Valiant, they do do, do not deserve any of those players. Like they way oh. overperformed their resources. <laughs> this year so they crazy. were great. I yeah. what I said has nothing to do with the players right. this year. They've been great, as you said. They were they brought a lot of entertainment, a lot of fun, and even a lot of competition in yeah. a situation where they had no right bringing that, right? That was not the front office offering anything to help them. Every time I slammed the office, I love the Valiant. I love 2018, 2019. There were great people there, the management there, but they aren't there anymore. Yes. And it is literally just run by a skeleton crew that don't give a shit anymore. And that hurts us when it is our livelihood to talk about them and they don't care. So why should yeah. I care about you? Yeah. yeah. Especially in, in the juxtaposition of like, a lot of those players actually do care a lot. Like, I, I feel mm -hmm. like, yeah. dude, like, if there's Crusher 99, it's Seeker. Okay. It's Seeker. Yeah. Yeah. But he's, he's talking about like hemorrhaging his own money to like put himself up, like, he'll pay his own contract, just like let him play. Like, that's competition. Like, dude. that's that's somebody who you want around. That's a lifer. <laughs> this yeah. is since, like, I was interviewing this guy and he was like, I'm like, oh, you're interested in collegiate? Nah, I just want to be the best in the world. Like, <laughs> Just like, that's oh what we need God. we need those people man. yeah but at the same time i'm like you know in a in a in a duty for care 
It's <laughs> like, bro, no. Tommy's eating top ramen for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He's just like, no, nah, I got to work on my craft, bro. I got it. Job's not done. Job's not done. We got to get in there. Valiant. You know, like, ah. And that's how things used to be, right? Like, yeah. and I can speak from personal experience. I moved across the world to live mm -hmm. in Canada to be able to compete. And the way I ended up making it pro was not by just showing up and be like, hey, guys, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I had to grind. I played in some shitty ass team that ended up playing in Gosu gamers that ended up being successful, that yeah. ended up giving my opportunity to play with the team Fnatic, that ended up getting me multiple lands that we ended up having to perform well at those lands to end up getting interest so that when the Overwatch League came around, they were interested in me as a player, right? That's how competition should exist. You have to continue to grind, find success, and then continue to find success to be successful. And I, I, I just, that's what I want. I just want yeah. that humbling comp uh, competition where everyone out there has the dog in them and everyone's grinding because you can't tell me that it's probably less than half but there are a bunch of players who are just kind of coasting through off of their previous ability and that oh. they don't actually care about winning anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, like, Varuna just <laughs> actually leaked what, what we talked about earlier. Um, like the, the insinuation here is who are you to Florida? Wow. Yeah. Which, right, like that, that would be frustrating, right? Like, who are yeah. you? Is, I think we can all agree is considered one of the best engines in the world. He, oh, yeah. compete, he just competed in the play-ins to try and qualify for the finals. It would be like, whoever gets him, if it is Florida, that's a huge story and that's awesome. But then mm -hmm. it's like, so I'm not going to watch Checkmate in the playoffs? Yeah. Like, yeah. That, that would Feels bad. really suck yeah. in the grand scheme of things. So it's like, I, I hope these rumors aren't true. And I hope that we see the teams as they are mm -hmm. going into the playoffs so that we can see every team play with the hand that they were dealt. Yep. Also, like, I, just you know, I'm, I'm in my week off, so I have no idea if this is true, but I'm just going to say it as well. Uh, Varuna said uh, Zarya Gen Genji, Soja and Bab Lucio is uh, playoff meta. I'm not sure if that's and true. That, like, no, that no. That would Gen not idea. surprise me at all. Yeah. Like, that would not surprise me at all. Those heroes all synergize incredibly well together. Um, like you, the Genji, you just bubble the Genji on uh, cooldown. Mm -hmm. And I that wouldn't surprise me why Florida would go for a Genji because you need, like, this isn't stand around Genji anymore where you're just yeah. climbing blade. This is going to be a, you're going in, you're going to get two bubbles and you're going to have a deflect. You need to kill one. Like, that's your job. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, then you're not doing your job. And there's not a lot of Genjis in the league who can do that. Oh. Who are you is definitely one of them. I... I'm I'm interested to hear your kind of take on this. Another one that I think is a little bit slept on that kind of surprised me from these these last couple playing games. Sugar Free kind of dirty with the Genji, kind of nasty with it. Kid was born to play Overwatch. I'm. It's just sad. <laughs> I really hope we get to see whatever Overwatch esports is in the future. Like follows it up. Yeah. He was 13. He was fucking us up when he was 13 <laughs> five years ago, right? Like he he's been around, you know, kicking around just doing yeah. the dirty work, and it's it's cool to see him get a platform. It's cool to see him really be able to show what he has after all these years. Like, remember, he retired. He took a year mm -hmm. off last year, and he just came back. That was like, that was the, the the asterisk. So, like, bro, he's 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 a you know he's taking a year off. He hasn't been playing, and then you know apparently he's got like six accounts in like top ten. It's like, all right, well, apparently he's been playing, and, and we're just you know, scratching the surface of like yeah. what he can offer. So you know, I I think you know if Vancouver make it, like he's. And that's when Yiska said that he actually loves dogs and there wasn't a technical ah, issue. Yeah, See, yeah. We had to cut out the part where, you know, we went off script and, you know, big, big blizzard came in and just, he just, they just couldn't let Yiska live. They had to, they had to cut him off at the knees. True. It was only a matter of time. They got him. They got to him. All the PR people just, they, they, they hacked him. They hacker mans him. Yeah, no, for sure. Like, I, I'm not sure what how it is for you guys, but if you're provide like I haven't been home in this apartment, and if mm -hmm. my provider goes like, oh, okay, he hasn't been home. Oh, he's back. Oh, this is very irregular usage of the internet line. There's something really weird going on. Let's shut this down. It's always the case. Like I was, like I I had to go to my mom's to water the plants, so I'm on like online during a time she wouldn't be home instantly mm. internet off like they're just really? like oh my god what is happening why is someone accessing the internet from this point <laughs> at 10 a.m in the morning is, is the robber like connecting to the wi-fi is that what it is like it's so weird <laughs> fuck vodafone by the way 
You're on Vodafone? Oh my god, I haven't used Vodafone in a hot minute. I, I, I feel like the only reason why American... I feel yeah. I feel like the only reason why Americans would know Vodafone is because weren't they were like a big sponsor of like either European football. I think they were in like esports for a little bit, right? They did like a couple sponsors. By by the yeah, way, I, I, so. Vodafone they're big, they're big in cricket. I think. Ah, I'm just also being a piss baby. They're actually really reliable comparatively to any other provider I had in the past. Like it's huh. it's just weird on those occasions. Like you download The Witcher and it just goes like, okay, that's uh. That's your internet stability for like a week. <laughs> so, okay. I'm noted. You've used your data. Subscribe yeah. to a premium account for unlimited. The good old days of having to like limit your bandwidth usage uh, a month to, to not get capped or throttled. Right. Yeah. Uh, unthrottling that discussion, you know, it's if Florida do land, who are you? And this meta does kind of pan out to be like the double pocket, the Genji, let him kind of cook, run all over the place. Who are you being a big player in that? You know, there's 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 some thorns on the rose for sure. You you want to see competitive players play, but you also want, you know, some level of security and what you're kind of trusting in the rules and what you assume when you kind of sign a roster. Um I think we were kind of talking about, you know, in the break, like, you know, you think of a team that did kind of splurge and did want to kind of build a super team. Um, what would they kind of feel like? You know, what would they kind of think if at the last second they could kind of just sign whoever they wanted? And, you know, all the rules that you would assume would be there kind of go out the window. Um, yeah, I that's I do do resonate who's, and do kind of feel bad. Who's the best yeah. available Baptiste that's Korean? Iris, maybe I don't know. Iris, yeah, I'd probably say Iris. Yeah. Like he's he's known he's a known Baptiste quantity. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a good player. Like I, I think he would be strong. I'm I'm surprised it's Baptiste. If I'm being honest, mm. I I I'm surprised it's not a Kiriko. Uh, mm. Kiriko, I feel like makes a lot more sense in that composition. Baptiste did just get nerfed on the regenerative burst. Baptiste kind of gets rolled by Genji in a lot of respects. True. I don't know. Like I, uh, that that seems surprising to me. But you know, it's the out teams. I trust them uh, right. and what they're ending up doing. But yeah, I, I, w as you said, we were talking about it in the uh, when we had that little break. And like, it, if you're Atlanta, you're kind of upset that you signed this well-rounded yeah. roster that really can cover all metas. You have an off tank, a main tank. You have double flex support. You have all these options. And now all, all the other teams in the playoffs. It's not even like halfway through the season. In the playoffs, are signing holes that they had in their roster to sort of compete with you like i can understand that. i would be frustrated if that if i had the option especially when it's like players of the caliber of who are you like yes you can say oh well anyone had the opportunity to sign who are you at any moment yes that's fair but who are you would only really be signed to an overwatch league team if it's a Genji only yes. matter, which yep. is looks like it's going to be. So who are you is only valuable on a short-term contract when you know a Genji meta is coming. So it's just kind of crazy that that's happening only in the playoffs. And I yep. think if Atlanta loses, you will see some salty tweets about it, especially if they end up losing oh, yeah. to a team that looks very different to the way they look right now. Mm -hmm. Rightfully so, to be fair. I will yeah. say... Don't sleep on Stalker Genji, dude. Like, that shit oh, no, is I like, yeah, I, yeah. Atlanta isn't going to... I would still put my money on Atlanta. Like, don't get me wrong. You're subbing in a, a Genji at the final hour, a player that, you know, is very volatile, or all those kind of things, right? Atlanta mm -hmm. still is chilling all the way to the bank. But that said, he's, they should be further ahead than they yeah. are. Here's, here's what's going to happen, okay? Someone is going to get MVP. Lip is going to get finals MVP. They are winning the title and everyone is going to be pissed mad because someone also is not a good Zarya. Therefore, proving the point that flexibility all the while was horseshit anyway. I feel like that's a little bit slanderous. He did, he did kind of break it out last year. It wasn't terrible. Oh, okay. I, I'm actually going to go with Yisker on this one and this is okay. my take. Is I think someone's biggest strength is his flexibility and he is exceptional on a lot of heroes. Sure. But he is not the best at any hero agreed. My agreed. Yeah. And that's the, and that's the thing. If we enter into a hard Zaya meta sure. and yeah. someone loses the ability to use his flexibility and understand it, because his his strength is he understands the game so well that when he makes swaps, they're usually the right decision mm -hmm. and they give them an advantage. But if you end up in a hard Zaya meta, all of a sudden there might be Zayas who are better than him that cause problems, right? Yeah. That's fine because he's top five, I would say probably every hero, right? Like in the league it's right good. now, I would say he's top five. 
uh, obviously better at some, worse at others. Zaya there is a very different hero. That's a hard hero. And I honestly don't even know what someone's Zaya looks like. We've probably seen it bits and pieces, but not enough to get a true gauge of where it stands up against other things. So we'll see. Maybe someone could struggle in these playoffs if he does end up being the solo tank. But if you're Florida, you're never taking someone out of that lineup. Oh. By the way, I oh. love how like everyone's like, oh, Hangzhou doesn't even have an incentive to win against the Dallas Fuel in the final. And the- dude, Hangzhou, uh, Spark winning against Fuel, therefore denying them the direct qualification might just save everyone's season at this point. Because if you look at that particular meta, right? It's mm-hmm. Han Bin Zarya, it's Sparkle Genji, Edison, we know from last year that like he can hang on Sojourn. It's okay, yeah. Bliss is also really solid on, on Lucia as well. That's why I asked about the free VAP, right? Like, if they actually could bring in the Iris or whatever, which I don't think is possible based on the rules, but, you know. Like, um, <laughs> this is a scary roster that actually legitimately could go all the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, yeah, like the Spark is the, you know, one good meta away. Like there's a lot of teams that are like one good meta away. And like, that's what mm-hmm. happens when you have a playoff patch, right? Like yep. I think let's use London Spitfire in the 2018 sure. uh, as a great example, right? Everything came together for them at the right time, at the right moment. It, like they were, they were terrible in the meta prior to like when the triple tank solo mercy stuff came out. They were terrible at it. Uh, like they were terrible at the meta prior to that. But as soon as that happened and they could play Prophet on Hanzo, Birdering on Widowmaker, but Dosen's playing Roadhog all of a sudden, right? Like that's what worked for them. And that's why mm-hmm. they ended up winning the whole thing. Like that can happen to a lot of different teams and the strengths of what got a team to this level might become irrelevant. Also, to just pre-end the comments that we're getting, oh, you said nobody that is not in top three and A has no chance. And now you're saying Fuel would have it. Yes, because it's fucking Hanbin. Hanbin True. is to Zarya what Lip is to Sombra. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the difference. That's why it, what we said generally makes sense, but in that particular sense, also because Sparkle Genji is also nuts, it can definitely hang uh, on a world stage. Like there, it makes sense, right? Yeah. Hundred percent. I mean, yeah. Like you, there's not too many heroes that you can really hit like if you're saying if it's going to be genji soldier and you know zarya like that's just kind of in their wheelhouse rush knows how to coach it they know how to play it that's that's kind of a, a recipe for success staying in apac for a second is it weird to at least be kind of curious as to how the dynasty might play with that you obviously have void kind of a you know a legacy zarya player Profit obviously very good at Genji. The rest of it is a little bit more wishy washy. But like, is there is there room for a dynasty play ins run that's a little bit more scary than maybe we're we're assuming? I think always. I think I think Solar are always a team that you have to be afraid from. And as you said, the meta can easily line up for them in a yeah. lot of regards, right? Like if Vindheim's able to just run around and play Lucio and do Lucio shit, like that's yeah. what he does best. And <laughs> You know, uh, they have um, like a lot of different options that they can play in terms of their like DPS. They're, they're, the problem that I think is I've just learned over the six years of the Overwatch League, five years mm-hmm. of the Overwatch League, just never trust Soul. Like I, <laughs> a, a, at some point, they're sure, just going to yeah. like decide that they suck and then Profit's going to try to carry them and then they're going to fall short. But they're yeah. definitely a Dark Horse team, but they have to make it through this bracket first, right? Yeah, yeah. They have to beat Dallas Fuel. And that's a... Cause, Tall order. It's something that a lot of people aren't aware of, but like Soul Dynasty are at the point where they're just, they're the Toronto Defiant of the East, where they're like, we're just going to play Alari everywhere and yep. just like hope for the best, um, yep. which might lose to the Dallas Fuel. There's only one team that's going to make it out of the Soul Dynasty and the Dallas Fuel. I think both will be good in this Zaya meta and will be able to hang with everyone if that's where it ends up going, but it's only one ticket out. They got to fight it out. Yep. There's also basically no shot these two teams won't be in the finals just based on how shit <laughs> yeah, Dragons and yeah, Josh yeah. have been, right? Like, they, we are getting two matches of that, those guys matching up, right? Because in upper and in lower bracket. Yep. Um, yeah. Or rather, finals. Um, so it's very likely that we're going to see that. I'm not sure. <laughs> Soul looked pretty good. <laughs> not going to lie. Like, um, I'm not, especially, I got to say, um, Krillin on the Hilari is kind of popping off. Like the yeah, especially really. the old usage huh. and like the sneaky like especially on Flashpoint, 
really good ults there. Like, super efficacious. Hmm. Is he, like, trying to, like, punish them on, like, rotations where he's like, oh, I think we're going to go, they're going to go yeah, this they, way, so I'll, like, kinda hide and ult him? Yeah. And 3Ks. Huh. Or, like, wow. f- three or four. Like Interesting. Yeah. Re- really I, that stuff. feels, that's always, like, a read for me that, like, they they feel very confident in their flashpoint. It's something that I kind of noted and questioned Christopher about last or a couple weeks ago with like London's flashpoint thing, where like they felt comfortable. They're doing all these like flanks and they're trying to like sneaky do some weird stuff. Maybe that's cheese. I don't know. I, I that to me reads as like comfortable. That's not I, what you is that a weird but, take? No, no, no. I I, th- I think it's fair. Like they they at some point there is a level of comfort coming from you know, being able to just play the same thing over and yeah. over again. But I think Soul Dynasty's, like, record over the last four m- series is, like, a great example of they beat the charge 3-1, and then they almost lost to SPG in the lower bracket. Right. They went to map five. Then they almost lost to Infernal in the lower bracket, and then they, like, beat the crap out of O2 Blast. Like, make that make sense in, in a lot of regards. And that sort of shows the fluctuation of the yeah. skill of the Soul Dynasty. And they really do live and die by just individual brilliance from profit from krillin and that's kind of how this shooter comp works when you're playing the alari so all the power to them i just don't have faith i guess the point i'm trying to get across is that soul dynasty in my opinion isn't this well-rounded oh, well-drilled sure. team in any regards is they're kind of just flying by the the seam of their pants in a, yep. in a lot of ways right like it could it could all crumble at any moment especially if we end up in like a meta shift into the playoffs so we'll see uh, they're a fun team to watch at the end of the day, yes. and it's kind of crazy thinking that either Dallas Fuel or Soul Dynasty won yeah. the final playoffs. Yeah. That's, I mean, that, I mean, did did we not open with those two teams in the inaugural season? Like that, I've, yeah. memory serves. Like that was the opening match. I was, yeah, was, I, yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, good times. We Jeez. fucking lost. <laughs> That, that was a, that was a that was a heater of a good match. If you want to go back and look at some crazy shit. The game has Soul changed Dynasty. a lot since then. If you oh, want to go check just, that out, bro, there were just swaps yeah, left and right. Yeah. It was chaos. DPS yeah. going to tank, tank yeah. going to DPS, random yeah. junk rap picks. Then we see fucking Widowmaker. Good times. <laughs> Dude, like it, thinking uh, about this and thinking about the competition right now, mm-hmm. like this, this moment, it, it feels like so special. And how, like it's almost like. Um, it feels like we're playing Squid Game at this point. Yeah. Oh yeah! Like if every out, round dead. of competition, we're just going to lose. Like, and it really feels, like, dude. I was, I was very close. I shed tears for Gladiators being out. Okay, like yeah, that. Yeah, that stuff got me right. Like, there's a lot of history, but and for Gladiators, it just feels much more secure because of the the guard situation. Yes. That we're, like, this is actually yeah. the determining factor in this, right? Um, yeah. That. Yeah, and also with that, with that volatility, I think like even if the plans for the future look re- really good, I think this is a natural cutoff point. Like this is New Year's or whatever, where people ju- will yep. just make decisions for their lives, and we will see an increased amount of retirements going forward. So every match I'm looking here, and I'm just going like, this guy just lost this match, therefore he- their career might be over, right? Yeah. So yeah, I like saying. you could you could absolutely see players like Kevsa retire. Like who oh, yeah. like because you know, let let's say in the world, right, let's go down that rabbit hole of if this is the last year of the league and we did go to circuit play, right? For whatever reason, that is going to be way worse for the players. The players are the ones who are gonna lose out the most, in my opinion, yeah. in that situation. You don't no longer have a guaranteed contract for the year. Most of your money's gonna have to come from academic organizations. There's no way a lot of them are gonna be paying minimum fifty thousand if the league isn't going to be as structured and um guaranteed as it is now for some of these teams so a lot of you could see a lot of players just sort of looking at the landscape of next year and just be like it's not worth it and yeah. you know for players who have already had long drawn out careers like kevster you could absolutely see him be like i'm just gonna go on live the rest of my life you know yeah. this has been a good chapter let's let's move on yeah and every every game feels like this like mm-hmm. yeah. and for profit specifically we already know that this guy like is thinking actively about retirement, right? So yeah. if Soul actually doesn't make it out of play-ins, boy, that will feel yeah. different. That will yeah. that will hurt for sure. That's that's an end. I mean, all of this is basically an end of an era, and it's just a slow, like you said, 
just degradation uh, every every new day we just we just have to say goodbye to some some familiar faces and that's never easy i i will say as well that's actually one of the saddest things that i have about the way that this circumstance is having is no. i wish there was some finality to the decision that this is the last right. year of the yeah. Overwatch league because that would allow us to give a proper send-off sure. to a lot of these teams and players who have given us so much entertainment and love and fun throughout all these years, it doesn't feel like we're saying goodbye to them in the long form because we don't have guarantees of yeah, that. We so know. we're sort of like half saying goodbye, half saying, you know, we're moving on. So it doesn't feel like we're able to give teams and players the proper send-off they deserve. Yep. I agree. And it's I also understand from the league's point of view why they can't do that because it's oh, yeah, of course, contingent yeah. on, on the... But yeah, like single-digit percent that we're having an Overwatch League next next year, right? Yeah. And that's how I personally treat it. And that with that come heavy decisions for those people who like lived Overwatch for a long time. Yep. Um, I think there there are formative differences that will inevitably like even if people really still have their heart in in this, will like have to be decided upon. And I I will just treat everything as like with the assumption that this is this is it right like yep and very likely some like a lot of players will stick around because they love overwatch that much they love the competition yep. that much right and well, they, seeker there will, out. <laughs> there will be uh comp always competition to um to ha be had but it will change in the nature and mm -hmm. the 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 people that will be around for it it doesn't take humans much to reconsider their life, right? Like sometimes oh, it's yeah. just like the the number on the back of the year changing gets you into the gym, right? Yep. Um, and or like I think the more like even in in big shift, like COVID made a lot of folks reconsider. Right? Oh yeah. This is yeah. like in in terms of like how their life is lived. This might be l as important, and a lot of people will consider where they are. And a lot of those guys are, are in their early 20s and they might just decide, you know, like time to get, go to the next stage of adulthood. Have a lot of savings, maybe go to school again and whatnot. They have to make real life decisions based on incomplete information at this point. A lot of those things presumably have to already be done. I'm thinking primarily of the 60% of our Korean players who yeah. have looming... It's like a military service. Military yeah. service that, that needs to be decided. And a lot of them will take that next step. And therefore, like, I'm just looking at this and it, I, I w won't lie, it adds a certain excitement to it. But it also is sad as shit. It's super yeah. sad. It's, it's, you know, what, you know, there are, there are players that we've, we've kind of, not to make it super flowery, but kind of grew up. You know, we watched them kind of grow into their career, and we we got to see you know the profits, the the voids, the you know shoe. Like imagine the shoe story coming to a close, and like you know Houston doesn't make it all the way. Maybe they don't even make the podium. That feels weird to say, but you know like seeing that kid not be able to you know fight for a title, even though that we we all know he has the skill to fight for one, and that's just it. And he's just like, yeah, I think I'm done. It's it's just. Not enough. There's not a lot of security. I still got like obligations to attend to. Like I got, I gotta go. Yeah, and I, the circuit's I, not gonna work for I'm me. I'm thinking of Yaki personally. Like uh, that's sure. that's yeah. that yeah. guy's story. I haven't talked to him. I haven't heard anything. But like the story and how it works and his motivations that he has shared with fans publicly, it just feels like he has played his last Overwatch League game. And that's yeah. not based on no knowledge. I haven't talked to any coaches or whatever. But it's just like a guy that always like tried to be paid well. That um, like was free to move anywhere and was perfectly happy, and if everything changes to that degree, it's also getting up there in age. It might just be have been the the last match that he played, right? Yeah, and I I think it it's important to remember like we we say these guys are young, but like these are also like very important years. Yeah. And, yes, and people are giving up like eighteen to twenty one, eighteen to twenty five. Like those really shape who you are yes. as a person and where you go into the future and it's worth noting like your life does come to a complete halt when you yep. playing pro and a lot of those skills don't translate into anything else yes. right there are very few career paths out of uh being a pro player that lead you in a direction that will help you in the long run right like like me personally like i was a player i'm now commenting that's great 
But if I wanted to get a real fucking job and you look at my resume, you're yeah. like, bro, what, what are you doing here, right? And that's <laughs> that's what a lot of these guys have to deal with. Is like, yeah. well, I need to go back to school, right? I should go to college. I should do all these types of things. And when you have such a big shakeup coming like this and you're losing that guarantee and that salary that you've had for so long, or you've even just started attaining, it's, it's a very easy time to ask the question of like, is it time to like find a new path, right? Yep. Yeah, there's also on, like, these are the formative years where they really determine like who you are and not going to be and how you're going to be perceived to be, right? Mm -hmm. And like, I, I, I think like, it's often undervalued. Everyone's like, oh, they can still go to school, blah, blah, blah. Yes. But these are also like incredibly talented people that if they had take, like there's a ton of people in the Overwatch League that had like Ivy League entrance uh, already like secured, right? Um, the, maybe maybe not just on the American um, on side, the of things. side of things, yeah. but on um, like also in, in Korean terms, right? I remember, I think... Um, NYXL support season one. Uh, later, Washington Justice. Uh, Smurfy. Anima? No, other guy. Washington Justice. Yeah. Later. Arc. Arc. I think oh, had Arc. Ivy League entrance. Um, like. Oh really? Well. Yeah, the Silk Thread. You know, like the, these guys are hyper talented. Like a lot of them are hyper talented. They put their life on hold for this. Oh. Uh, yeah. I'm sure. Like a lot of the they feel like it was worth it, but also the league didn't go where it was advertised to be. Yep. And they have to make hard decisions. And I feel like a lot of them will come away and think like, I'm not sure if it was worth it. And this breaks my heart for them. Right. I, I think especially for a lot of the newer generation coming in who are probably coming yes. in on minimum contracts, like for people during my era of playing 2018, 2019, 2020, like even if you did blow out or like, you know, players didn't have the best career, right? Let's use let's use the Boink example that Dante, you know, brought up where it's like Boink was making like room at 150K. Yeah. Like he didn't have a successful career by any, uh, like by most yes. standards, right? But he also made 150k in a year, which at the age of you know 20, yeah, that's not that sets you up in a lot of regards. You're no, not going to yeah. feel that regret. But you compare that to some of the players these days. Like let's talk about the Valiant players who sure. have been playing Overwatch for five years to finally get their shot in the league, and they probably get paid not very much money to compete, and their season wasn't as you know successful as they would like like it. They had some fun, and they probably made friends, and they they got to experience it, but they don't have a lot to come out of it with. Uh, is yeah. the sad reality for those guys nothing tangible a lot of yeah. uh a lot of stuff that I, I i think is probably worth um and and this is not even fair to speak on and, and is incredibly biased but you know i i think that at the end of things i think it is like cool to like follow your passion and chase something and get to a degree of expertise in, in a realm i think that's really really cool and i think that's endearing to as as a person you look at somebody and you ask them about their life and it's just like yeah i i was you know among the best maybe not the best but like i was there i was in the conversation i was you know battling some of the best people to ever do it um and you know we we, we danced a little bit we had we had some words and like that's that's pretty fucking cool i think that's like dope is it dope for you i guess that's for them to decide but you know, yeah, I I get what you're saying. It's it's tough. It's it's definitely uh, dark in some realms. Um, let's hope that maybe the the allure of the stage maybe gets people back. Obviously, that's a big gripe that a lot of players have. It's like, what am I doing this for? I I, I, I want to play in front of people. I want to hear the crowd. Like, I want to be there. I yeah. I, if you never play it on a crowd, it, that's that's what it is all for. Like, even know? just like that one three weekend. It's not even just like playing in front of the crowd. It's everything that goes around with sure. a live event, the fans. Yep. The interaction, hanging out with other players, everything involved with that, like playing, yeah, it just it's a it's a completely different world and it's a completely different life. Uh, yeah. That, like as you said, some players really might not ever, not ever get to experience. Yeah, I will say, I think there's something to be said about being able to demonstrate to remain and on the top of the highest level for several years and what it says about your work ethic. I, I there's yeah. some anecdotal evidence that like the market has realized that there's potential in these grinders, right? Like that also like it's, it's not the guy that really is only like, you know, hard grinding overwatch because they're like hyper focusing on the game and they couldn't imagine doing anything else. It's about the like super hard grinders that will sit on the aim labs that will meticulously 
uh, practice. Yeah. And those guys just like have shown a level of tenacity and grind that will translate pretty well, right? In, in oh, yeah. Of- there's there's like core formative life experience is the right word but like the way that they have like molded their brain in some ways and maybe like through sheer willpower have like just put themselves in that driver's seat that like yeah there there are career paths that is going to align with like how you've lived your life for the last n years you know like whether it's you know since the start of overwatch or whatever like it may not necessarily translate in terms of like skill set that you've developed but like the underlying workings of how your your brain you know what you're into how much you can kind of give like what kind of like tolerance or bandwidth of like willpower you can kind of like you're talking about like it, i feel like there is like a natural progression of like going into like i don't know coding or like anything anything real crunchy i feel like you could probably put like a former pro player depending on like who they are and they probably could like jive with it you know yeah yeah just and something that they can just grind out like you said for sure and that they like a lot of former Overwatch League, not just players, but also coaches and staff and whatnot, are doing mm-hmm. pretty well for themselves, right? Like, yeah. they they just developed a skill set. It's being recognized at the highest level. If they can sell themselves, well, it's not it's not considered necessarily a hole in the in uh, resume, the resume, especially for yeah. something as visible as the Overwatch League. With yeah. right, like that's that was in the media for a while. So it might be even a boon on your resume if you can sell Isn't it well. I think that's probably the, the the gist of it is like can you can you make your employer believe that like this is going to be beneficial to them and like you said sell yourself um any last thoughts Costa before we wrap up no that's that's most of it beautiful beautiful all right well before we get out of here do want to give you like a little bit of a little bit of a you know a platform see if like, anything's coming up for you anything you're excited about any, anything uh... you want to plug no, not really. Like I, my Twitter, my Twitch, both Custer. I have a YouTube as well that I do VOD reviews for Overwatch and stuff. Obviously, we're about to go into the the dark off season, so we'll see what <laughs> ends up coming on that YouTube and and all that kind of content. But I do have a content piece on the horizon uh, after the Overwatch League finishes that I'm trying to trying to get done. So keep an eye out for that Very one. Cool. But other than that, see you guys in Toronto. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a great event. Beautiful, beautiful. Jessica, anything coming up? Um, I'm on vacation, but after we're, uh, I'm definitely diving into the playoff preparation content. Unfortunately, won't be mm-hmm. able to make it out to Toronto. Um, Aww. but like, yeah, looking forward to like, I'm not sure if uh, what the access will be like, but I'm I'm trying my best to um to bring as much Overwatch League content, and then as it looks, I might just stick around for the next version of uh, Overwatch esports as well. So. There we go. 